Hello, everyone. Madison Cawthorn with the nope, Warrior Princess. I'm, Society. I'm actually I in charge. Jo I'm in charge. This is my video. Is this this is this is the Warrior Poets chair? Yeah. And you're in it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is I, my show. I feel like you're. I feel like you just kind of rolled in to my life. Is that like a wheelchair joke? I mean, there's a lot of jokes that could be made. Like you really stand up for America. I'm out of here. How do you work this thing? I'm missing. I'm missing my mark, but I'm going now. Jerk. All right, what's happening, folks? Welcome back. Today, I have a special guest, Congressman Madison Cawthorn, great Second Amendment advocate. Really, really like this guy. He's become a friend over the last, I don't know, half a, half a year since I've met him. And uh, anyway, have a really hot topic that we want to go with. He is the youngest elected congressman, 26 years old uh, in modern history. And so, Madison, thanks so much for being with us. John, great to be with you. you know, I followed the Warrior Poets Society for about five years, so it's a, it's a real honor to be here. Yeah, and you're all kitted up. I am. Dude. I have every single one of your shirts. Every single one. Bro, you're my homeboy. Thanks so much. So now that you've been in Congress for how long? I've been there. This is my, I'm going on my second year. So long enough that you kind of have the lay of the land, right? I know where the bathrooms are at this point. Fantastic. It's a funny way to say it. That's great. Uh, to me, as an onlooker, I hate politics. I really dislike politicians. Uh, you're okay-ish, right? That's a really uh, so that, that's a high bar. I'm that's okay. That's a high bar. We're like, mm, yeah. man, well, it's just just because I feel like it's just such rampant corruption. Yes. And I feel like every time a politician speaks, it's all these like empty platitudes, like it's a competition. How corrupt is it? Uh, number one, I think that it has to do with the really the fallen nature of man. Uh, a lot of these people are all a big fish in a little pond where they come from. They're all very important. Now, they now have the name honorable in front of them. They've got bulletproof glass, velvet ropes, security everywhere they go. Um, and then they get to Washington and they're no longer the big fish in a little pond. They're just a fish in a very large ocean and everyone's a big fish. A few years ago, my wife and I started watching a disgusting show and we ended up giving up on it after a while, but it was an interesting study for us it was revealing it was a, a show called house of cards i'm gonna turn my hat around for this this is are you familiar with house it's about of to get cards serious. yes i am with uh kevin spacey and i forget who else uh was in it um uh, but anyway, really well done show very really, well done very show. well done show but it was so dirty and it was about this uh congressman uh who was kevin spacey who was, I think it was minority or majority whip yep what, what was it yeah and so anyway very very powerful guy and it was just kind of like his secret life of all this corruption and power and money and perversion. And it was just dirty. How much, in your opinion, because you've been behind the veil, is this a fictitious show? Or is this more closer to like a documentary? Is, is it that bad? So I heard a former president that we had in the 90s was asked the question about this. And he gave an answer that I thought was so true. And he said, the only thing that's not accurate in that show is that you could never get a piece of legislation about, uh, about education passed that quickly. And that's, everything else is good. Uh, aside <laughs> from that, I mean, the sexual perversion that goes on in Washington, I mean, it, being kind of a young guy in Washington, with the average age is probably 60 or 70. And I look at all these people, a lot of them that I, I, you know, I've looked up to through my life, I've always paid attention to politics, guys that, you know, it, then all of a sudden you get invited to, like, well, hey, we're going to have kind of a, a, a sexual get-together at one of our homes. You should come. And I'm like, what, what, what did you just ask me to come to? Yeah. Uh, and then you realize they're asking you to come to an orgy. Yeah. Uh, or, or the fact that, you know, there's some of the people that are leading on the movement to try and remove, you know, addiction in our country. And then you watch them do, you know, a key bump of cocaine right in front of you. And it's like, wow, this is, this is wild. And then there's also kind of the whole espionage aspect of what goes on in Washington of, you know, so many people trade in secrets and there, there's a currency to secrets. And yeah. so uh, it, it's wild. And then, you know, there's members of the, of the, the media, the journalists who kind of will keep nasty stories about you or about other people on a shelf. And then what if you're about to kind of speak out against something they don't want you to, they'll come out and say, well, we're about to drop the story of when, you know, 17 years ago you did X, Y, and Z. And you don't want us to drop that story, do you? So we're, we're going to bully you back into this position. Practically, let's say that all of a sudden I was going into office. By the way, I have no political aspirations, zero. And people are always like, John, run for office. It'll be like, nope, absolutely not. I'd like to support people that have that calling. I have no desire to do that. But let's, as a little thought experiment, 
I am just elected Congress and whatever. And I get in there and I go through my orientation and I, I have my good values and stuff. And I stand for something like many other before. Uh, how does that slippery slope actually get in front of me? Our current president, you know, he's been in public service for 50 years at a certain salary, which is kind of like, it's good, but it's not great. You can't become a lavish multi, multi, multi millionaire with all these different houses. And it, the math doesn't work. Like the battery so, example, that, that was a real example. That's right? a real example. Yeah. No, I, right before we added, uh, announced we were going to add about 700,000 electric vehicles to our federal fleet. I noticed because if you go to, uh, yeah, I think it's CEOwatchlist.org, you can see the trades that publicly traded companies, CEOs, and anybody in the C-suite are making or all, what all trades members of Congress are making. And so we all kind of monitor that just to see what's going on. And I noticed a lot of people in the majority party were buying stocks that had to do with some kind of battery, some kind of technology for electric vehicles. And then wouldn't you know it, about a month or two later, it was then announced we're adding 700,000 electric vehicles to the uh, to the, to, the, to the fleet and then all those stock prices just jump, whether you're investing in lithium mines, whether you're investing in the people who actually manufacture batteries, whether you're investing in directly into companies that make electric cars. Um, and so that's a way people can make money is through the, this kind of version of insider trading that people can do. But th we are limited on our ability to have any kind of earned income. You can have passive income, but you can't have any earned income. And so we, you can't sit on a board and get a salary for it or anything like that. Um, but what you can do is you can have your spouse put as chairman of this company. You can have your spouse saying that she's going to be, or he, he or she is going to be a, a consultant to this firm. And next thing you know, they're getting a paycheck for really not doing anything. Could, uh, could your son? Your son? Oh, oh. yeah. Hmm? Hmm? Huh? <laughs> See what you did there? <laughs> but, uh, but when you first get to Washington, you, John Lovell just got elected. And don't run for Congress. It's, uh, it's, it is, it, is, it, is a, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to help people so much and to be able to cut through bureaucratic red tape that takes people years to get through and bring life-saving care to these people. It's incredible. But Washington, D.C. is a, a pit of vipers, and I, I am there just for a quick purpose. Most of the people that get elected is the best job they'll ever have. That's why they never want to le lose it. I think this is probably, aside from the honor of getting to serve my constituents, Working in Washington is like the worst job in the world. I could be at the mountains of Western North Carolina. I never want to go that close to the Mason-Dixon line in my entire life. Yeah. Um, but so anyways, you get elected, hypothetically. Once you get to Washington, freshman orientation is very enlightening. You learn a lot of the procedures, but it's also made to be very, I'm not sure if this is the right word, but obsequious. It's difficult to understand. You get told information, but it's not explained to you in a way where you understand exactly what needs to happen. And so therefore, you start relying heavily on your leadership, the people who are elected, whether it's the Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader, whoever it is. We have a pretty good leadership team in Washington right now for uh, uh, my side of the aisle. Um, but then you have to heavily rely on people who have been there for a lot of years or people who are elected to leadership in Washington. And this then starts to consolidate power within the leadership because instead of having, you know, you need 218 members to vote for this, well, this one member might control 70 votes. And so then they can really throw their weight around because not only now they're not just representing 700,000 people, it's, we're talking 7 million, we're talking 70 million. Uh, and so the way that Washington works, the way that you start to get bought, uh, the way that you start to lose the power over your vote, is that you start asking leadership, well, hey, what should I do in this situation? I, I don't really understand what this bill is doing. Can you walk me through this? And then all of a sudden they will tell you, oh, well, yeah, you just want to vote for this. And then your voting record starts going down this trail that you don't know, no longer have popular support of the people to support your campaigns. And so then you're starting to have to rely on these special interest groups, these, uh, these super PACs and these, these organizations who want to see their legislation passed, not, not necessarily because it has to do with your district, but because it helps their business. And so these people are called lobbyists. Uh, now, I'm very fortunate in my position to where, you know, I, I get, you know, probably $5 from 500,000 people a year versus most people who have to rely on that seven or $70,000 check from one individual person. Yeah. And so if I have a normal American who gives me $5 because they believe in something I'm saying and what I'm standing for, they're not going to feel like they have the gumption to show up and say, I need you to do this really backwater vote for me because yeah. I gave you $5. Right. And so, but once you start taking these votes that leadership wants you to take, you lose the support of the American people because they're like, oh, you're just another Washingtonite. Yeah. And that's what it starts to look like. And that's how you start losing your patriotic fervor. And then you start becoming bought and paid for and desiring to be at a higher level in the swamp. 
What, who was the comedian that said he wished that, uh, you know, Congress people or politicians would wear the names of the people who bought them, like NASCAR drivers? <laughs> yes. So everyone would know, like, oh, he's big, big pharma. Like, yeah. The guy does big pharma. Here's an interesting question. I just came up with it. Who do you think is, is the greater kind of threat to our legislative branch? A lot of people want to blame Antifa and AOC and, and, and a lot of these people for the problems we face in our country. I think the problem we face in our country is we have had a conservative movement in this country who has been so dedicated to playing defense. They've been so dedicated to being the party of no, and we're going to fight against everything that you stand for, but we're not really going to offer you any solutions. I mean, how many times did you hear, well, we're going to repeal Obamacare, but you never really heard what their plan was to actually, how they were going to do it, what they were going to implement in its place. You never ever heard that because we never go on offense. We never set the narrative. We'll allow our opponents to set the narrative the, the entire time. And so I think that the, the biggest opposition to the legislative branch uh, from elected members is actually the rhinos, the Republicans in name only. Uh, they're spineless, they're cowardly, and the problem is, is they will run on radically different platforms than the Democrats. But once they get to Washington, they'll vote basically the exact same way. And it, it confuses the American people, makes them lose faith in, the, in, in their government, which people should lose faith in, their, faith in their government right now. But the biggest threat to the American people having a say over what's happening in our government is the bureaucratic class. And these are people who are not elected. These are people like, uh, you know, the people, who, the guy who le leads the NIH. Uh, these are the, the bureaucrats who work at all the three-letter agencies of the executive branch, which has become the fourth branch of government. Um, now, what is so bad about the bureaucrats in Washington and all, and all these agencies is that they are practically unfireable. You basically cannot get rid of them for anything. And I was having it explained to me by an expert in the field that, well, yeah, I mean, once you want to fire a bureaucrat for not doing their job, well, first they're going to have to go to this counseling thing. And if it's found that, you know, their father raised their voice at them when they were eight years old, it means that they're a part of a minority class that's been abused. And so you're discriminating against them by requiring that they actually do a good job for the American people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have this bureaucratic class who all of a sudden, you know, most of them start out wanting to be good patriots and helping their country and serving in the system. But then all of a sudden they realize, wait, I can't get fired. Why, why am I doing maximum level work for when I'm just going to get the same paycheck either way? Yeah. And that's why our government moves so slowly. Um, so how effective can you be if the other side of the aisle hates you and the rhinos hate you even more? You're calling out their apathy, their, their cowardice, their duplicity. I mean, they've got to hate your guts too. Mm -hmm. If you're not playing ball and compromising a little bit, because you're a no, no compromise guy, in another video that we're going to do, we're going to talk through your America First uh, doctrine and your new contract with the American people. Of like, I, I read through it and I'm like, bro, it's everything I ever wanted. So we'll talk about that in another video. And uh, but holy cow, how do you expect to get such a, you know, narrow? Uh, thing passed when you just rampant corruption everywhere. So the biggest thing is, yes, the other side does detest me. Uh, now, obviously, behind the scenes, some people can be friendly and all this stuff, and they'll say it's just work. Uh, but to me, it's like, well, you're lying to my entire generation and getting them to believe an ideology that killed over 100 million people last century. So, uh, no, I don't want to go out for a drink with you afterwards. I, I don't want to be your friend. Yeah. Um, but then there are some people over there who are just, you know, they say they're they're, they're moderates, but really they're just getting bullied around by the, the radicals in their, their part wing of the party. The reason I'm able to go up against the establishment and kind of that rhino class in Washington without facing much opposition or being, being able to accomplish things, uh, as a freshman member of Congress, we've passed almost more bills. We've introduced more legislation than the other freshmen. Um, and a lot of people say, wow, how do you do that when the media hates you so much, when you're a firebrand, when you say things that you know, are not supposed to be said in politics? Right. And the reason is, is because the advent of social media has been so incredibly powerful. Whereas previously, if you wanted to get something done in Washington, D.C., you needed to convince 218 members of Congress to have uh, just a very narrow majority plus one. I have actually found that it is much easier to convince 30 million Americans of the truth, who people who have common sense and are being bought and paid for by these lobbyists, of what is going on. And then when they all turn on their members of Congress and they say, well, why, if you're not voting for this, what, why not? And then people are starting to pay so much attention right now, especially the young mothers in our country whose children are starting to be jerked around by the system and are starting to be used as political pawns. I feel like the, the 
elitist movement in Washington really made a mistake when they started going after the kids because the most ferocious people in our movement are the, are the mothers. Yeah. And they're starting to be so dialed into what's going on in Washington, D.C. that when someone they trust, like myself, uh, there's a few other members of people in, in, in trust in government, when we go out and speak the truth and now that we can circumvent the mainstream media and take it directly to people via social media, all of a sudden, all of these members of Congress who are very cowardly and they're very fickle go back to their district and they, you know, in reality, they might just have 40 or 50 of their constituents come up to them and kind of berate them and be like, why aren't you supporting this? Why do you not believe in this conservative doctrine? Why, why does Madison Hawthorne say you're a rhino? And then all of a sudden they get very afraid yeah. because this is the best job they've ever had. Yeah. And they love having their name in the paper every other week. And so that's why we're able to kind of bully people around. And yes, it's a form of bully politics. And I understand that I am not everyone's cup of tea. I understand that I'm probably not the most fun person to bring up at your Thanksgiving dinner with your liberal relative saying, oh yeah, I really like Madison Cawthorn. I understand that you might read some articles about me that makes people uncomfortable. And most, a lot of kind of your old establishment members of the Republican Party, they don't really like a guy who's tatted up, who believes in the Second Amendment, who says, if you're a tyrant that starts coming from my family, I will shoot you in the face. And they're like, well, that's a little extreme. And, and my counter to that is, yes, I am extreme because we live in extreme times. Yeah. If we do not take go on offense against this government m initiative to take the power away from the people and give it to an unelected bureaucratic class, then we are going to damn the next generation to be absent and robbed of the freedoms that were promised to us by our founding fathers. Right, and you say extreme. I'd point out you're extreme in a world that's moved so much. You're extremism is really, I just want to go back to the way it was a hundred years ago in mm. terms of conservative values, right. not in terms of reincorporate all the evils that we have corrected since a hundred years ago. Your big idea is like, I'd like a smaller government and an emphasis on family. And that's extreme now, but it's just kind of like good old conservatism. You're extreme in that you want the good stuff that we had a hundred years oh, ago, right? Exactly, it's, it's wild that, that they've started being able to put these labels. Somehow that's extreme and I yeah. don't understand how. It's because I, I don't want the government to be involved in your life. I think the federal government should make sure that we never lose a war, we have good roads, and we have dominant trade deals. Yep. Aside from that, keep your hands off my life. Yep. And I think that's something that almost everybody believes in. I think we need term limits on bureaucrats, term limits on members of Congress. Uh, I think that we should remove the federal income tax because the federal government, you're not an indentured servant or a slave to the federal government. Yep. Uh, I genuinely believe that we should remove almost every single regulation on manufacturing in the United States so we can bring all of that back and give good, high-paying jobs to rural communities who are suffering right now, especially so many of them that are in minority communities. Yeah. But we just want to say, no, 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 well, we're going to put so many restrictions on what you can build and what you can make that all the jobs have to go elsewhere. It, it, makes, our, it makes basically our entire economy just this fiat. fiat. Yeah. And it's something that doesn't actually exist. And so when you hit economic hard times like we have with, uh, with this virus that happened in 2020 and 2021, uh, when everything gets shut down, all of a sudden your economy starts to be destroyed. But now I'm extreme because I don't want the federal government to be able to have the power to do that to you. No, it, it's normal. They're extreme and to disagree with them yes. looks extreme to the extremists. There is without a doubt, there's a group of people and it, it's, it's not as organized as a lot of people would think. Um, but I, I have found that there are definitely people who are calling the shots who are not in the public eye people who are kind of pushing members of Congress around to do what they want. And this is the reason, I mean, you, you know, you got, you got John Boehner, started as a really good Speaker of the, speaker of the House and then uh, went down very quickly. And the reason is because he was in Washington so long, so many people ha knew his pressure points and knew his buttons. And so basically, if you get a member of Congress on a secret that they're terrified of, let's say you caught them having an affair or you, you did something and you're, you threatened to tell their wife or something, and that's an extreme case. It's, things like that don't happen every single day. I mean, that's, but if that does happen and they have that leverage over you, once you're like, oh yeah, okay, if you want me to vote, if you won't, won't say anything, I'll, I'll, I'll vote with you. Well, next thing you know, they'll bring it up again and again and again and again. And then one of their, but they might be drinking with their buddies one day. He's like, oh, you want to know how I got this passed? Well, I've got this dirt on this person. And then it gets spread around. And this is why we need term limits because yeah. We're a fallible people. I mean, we're, we are fallen men. We're, we're, we're ruled by our flesh in a lot of ways. I genuinely believe that this world is under the principality of the, of the, the devil. Um, and that's why there's so much sin and evil in the world. And when you go put yourself in this position of great power, uh, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it and there's a lot of pitfalls. And so the longer you spend in Washington, D.C., the more of an opportunity you have to be able to have a pressure point and a weakness. And once that gets spread around to enough people, all of a sudden, nobody respects your ability to govern anymore, and then you're just working to try and keep your position, not actually help the people. 
I respect all that. Did you just quote Spider-Man? <sighs> the new Tom Holland movie when you had Tobey Maguire and the other Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield, all come out at one time. That's pretty was cool. freaking sick. That was awesome. And that's, that, that was see, awesome. Th th that's American exceptionalism. Because Ameri I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to get into a so story good. deal. And I'm sorry to get off track here, but no, this is a uh, this is we need to talk about. The so Spider -Man. once I saw the I saw the other two Spider Mans come into the, the Marvel Spider Man, and they all fought at the same time. I was like, I'm going to go back and watch the old Spider Mans, and so yeah. I watched you know I watched them all. But I was watching the Andrew Garfield one, and there was a scene where he had gotten shot in the leg, and the, you know, his his Gwen was getting killed way down the street, and he was trying to you know do his Spider Man thing all the way down, yeah, and couldn't make it. And then there was this blue collar worker who he had saved the child of one day and they were watching him on the news and he's like, hey, hang on, hey, you guys aren't getting off shift. And then he, all of a sudden you see him start climbing a ladder yeah. and then you see him getting on the radio and he's like, hey, are you on fifth? I want you to turn over the, the thing. And then you had all these blue collar workers turn their cranes over this one boulevard in, yeah. in New York so that Spider-Man would have these things to grab onto and fly really fast. And then they were like, we're gonna help Spider-Man right now. And it just reminded me that when the good hearted Americans of this country all get together to be able to do something. As much as it seems like we're outnumbered, outgunned, and out, outmaneuvered by the Washington elites and kind of this cabal who's running our country, I always am reminded of when our founding fathers started that spark of revolution that happened. When they declared in Philadelphia, they were, they were declaring independence from Washington, or from, uh, from the king. Make no mistake of how brave that was because they did it right on the seat of the power of the greatest naval force in the world. They did it at a port city where their navy could come. They said, hey, we're here, and if you want us, come get us. And they didn't have a standing army. And, and, but then once the army came, everyone thinks, oh, all the Americans rose up and fought. Yeah. No, the majority of the Americans were loyalists to the king and fought on his side because they thought there's no chance. It was really only 3% of the American population in North America actually fought against the, the British Empire. And it reminds me, man, when just a good hearted group of Americans come together, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. And so I know that you were, when I was talking about the new contract with America, you were saying, I mean, you know, you looked at me kind of, and you're like, well, that doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of getting past. I mean, it'd be great, but it doesn't stand a chance. I disagree. When I see the patriotic fervor that's going on in our country right now, when I see the fact that the next generation is being threatened, I think we're going to have a lot of people like me who don't have Ivy League degrees, who haven't been in, in, in waiting their turn in, in politics long enough, but they're going to say, they're going to look around and when the party leadership says, well, we want you to serve in Congress, but you, you got to wait about 12 years because there's some people in line ahead of you and you haven't paid your dues to the party yet, and so right. you can't run yet. Yeah. I want just the normal Americans to look around and say, well, who the hell am I in line behind? Right. Because whoever's come before me has left a despot of a country that I'm now having to raise my children in that is so divided that we're almost to kinetic forces meeting each other. Yeah. And I think that we're going to have great patriots rise up and we're going to take our country back. That's awesome. Well, politically, we're not, I'm not saying, well, you know. They're going to have to check out that other video, guys. I'll provide a link uh, down below. Thanks, brother. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Guys, if you like this video, make sure you go ahead and subscribe for more future content. We have all kinds of exciting stuff uh, coming down the pipeline. Like, share. Also, make sure you check out Madison Cawthorn's website. I'll put a link down below for you guys so you can check out more about what he's doing. Demand accountability from your local uh, and your uh, state federal representatives for your area. Make sure uh, that you find out whether you got entrenched bureaucratic rhinos representing you. You might, and you need to get rid of them, and we can't afford to be apathetic anymore. Guys, I appreciate you warrior poets out there. I need you uh, to train hard, train smart, and stay free because it doesn't happen accidentally, right? See you Remember, guys. dry fire often. Dry, hey, bro, there that's go. good. This week I will be learning from Jorge Rubio, uh, amazing coach. And I'm sure they're gonna learn a lot. He's full of details of, and his knowledge is out of his world. Hey, hey! Hey, hey, hey! After being with him with three, four hours, I only read one page of that encyclopedia. So I want to come back and continue learning. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to read the whole book.